and free on all platforms. I was there too. And I thought he was going to come back to the room. So I grabbed him and I put it all over me. Gut wrenching testimony from the people whose tragedy became the focal point of a nationwide debate. In chilling detail, an 11 year old survivor describes the terror inside her Robb Elementary School classroom in Uvalde, Texas, how she played dead to save her own life, a pediatrician who saw the horrific aftermath firsthand, and parents with a dire warning. Somewhere out there, there's a mom listening to our testimony, thinking, I can't even imagine their pain not knowing that our reality will one day be hers unless we act now. We are bleeding out and you are not there. My oath as a doctor means that I signed up to save lives. I do my job. And I guess it turns out that I am here to plead, to beg, to please, please do yours. Threat on the life of a Supreme Court justice, what we know about the arrest of an armed man found on the street near Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home. The eve before explosive primetime hearings, the January 6th committee prepared to present new, never before seen evidence of the attack on the U.S. Capitol. ABC News Live has a look ahead at what to expect in what could be a once in a lifetime event. How unprecedented is this kind of hearing? I, I think it's, hopefully, it's once in a nation's history. The next generation of the COVID vaccine, Moderna, now says that their updated booster will provide superior protection against the Omicron variant. The new data amid growing concerns of a fall surge and just how soon those boosters could be administered. DragCon 22, yeah! Self-expression, creativity, freedom. Drag has evolved into an art form and a source of pride in the LGBTQ plus community. The fact that I'm even here doing this, like 1,000%, we are breaking doors and coming through loudly and proudly. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us tonight. We are tracking that thwarted plot to assassinate Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. But we do begin with the chilling and emotional testimony on Capitol Hill today as several Uvalde victims and their loved ones told their stories one by one, begging lawmakers for change. Fourth grader Mia Surio described how she smeared blood from her friend on herself to make it seem like she was dead so that she could live. She says she doesn't want to go back to school because she fears another shooting will happen. With her voice quivering and her husband at her side, you see her right there, Kimberly Rubio, whose 10-year-old daughter Lexi died inside Robb Elementary, asked lawmakers why guns are more important to them than children. After that hearing, the House voted on several key gun measures. This, while a bipartisan team of senators is working toward a compromise, but right now it remains unclear if this time will be any different than the result after Columbine, Sandy Hook, or Parkland. We're standing by to talk with two lawmakers, one Democrat and one Republican, who were both in the room for that emotional hearing earlier today. But first, our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, brings us the gut-wrenching moments and a warning that some of you may find the testimony difficult to hear. I am Kimberly Rubio. This is Felix Rubio. Tonight, in front of the nation, the gut-wrenching testimony from the families who have lived this. Kimberly and Felix Rubio lost their 10-year-old daughter, Lexi, in Uvalde. Both parents were at the school that very morning for award ceremonies. Lexi received the Good Citizen Award and was also recognized for receiving all A's. At the conclusion of the ceremony, we took photos with her before asking her to pose for a picture with her teacher, Mr. Reyes. That photo, her last photo ever, was taken at approximately 10.54 a.m. To celebrate, we promised to get her ice cream that evening. Then the mass shooting. Like so many parents, they frantically showed up, waiting for hours, then taken to the Civic Center. Soon after, we received the news that our daughter was among the 19 students and two teachers that died as a result of gun violence. We don't want you to think of Lexi as just a number. She was intelligent, compassionate, and athletic. She was quiet, shy, unless she had a point to make. So today, we stand for Lexi. 
and as her voice, we demand action. We seek a ban on assault rifles and high capacity magazines. We understand that for some reason, to some people, to people with money, to people who fund political campaigns, that guns are more important than children. So at this moment, we ask for progress. We seek to raise the age to purchase these weapons from 18 to 21 years of age. We seek red flag laws, stronger background checks. We also want to repeal gun manufacturers' liability immunity. Also in front of the country today, a brave 11-year-old, Mia Cerillo, survived. On video, telling lawmakers about the moment the gunman told her teacher goodnight and then shot her in the head. Mia saying she played dead by putting the blood from her friend on her clothes. He shot my friend that was next to me, and I thought he was going to come back to the room, so I grabbed the blood and, and put it all over me. And what did you do then when you put the blood on yourself? Just stay quiet, and then I got my teacher's phone and called 911. And what did you tell 911? I told her that we need help and to send the police in, the, in our classroom. There was also Dr. Roy Guerrero, the only pediatrician in Uvalde, who cared for many of the children since birth. Two children whose bodies had been pulverized by bullets fired at them, decapitated, whose flesh had been ripped apart, that the only clue as their identities was a blood splattered cartoon clothes still clinging to them. A gun owner himself, the doctor calling for change. Innocent children all over the country today are dead because laws and policy allows people to buy weapons before they're legally old enough to even buy a pack of beer. They're dead because restrictions have been allowed to lapse. They're dead because there are no rules about where guns are kept because no one is paying attention to who is buying them. Another witness called by Republicans argued it's not the guns. Lucretia Hughes lost her 19-year-old son to gun violence, countering what others said. I claim that nothing in these bills do anything to make us safer or address the mental health crisis in this country. I believe it is our God-given right to defend ourselves from any act of violence. The chairwoman of the House Oversight Committee comparing the U.S. to other countries, arguing it is a gun problem. As you can see in this chart, in 2019, the United States suffered 17 times more gun deaths than the next highest G7 country. Between 2009 and 2018, the U.S. had 288, 288 school shootings. All other G7 countries combined had just five. Some of my colleagues on, across the aisle have blamed the violence on mental illness. They have blamed violent video games. They have blamed family values. They have even blamed open doors. They have blamed everything but guns. But we know the United States does not have a monopoly on mental illness, video games, or any other excuse. What America does have is widespread access to guns. The ranking Republican on the committee and his response. Too often tragedies are politicized for partisan gain. And we have seen many seek to leverage these crimes and their victims to push for radical left-wing policies or to betray their campaigns. And as lawmakers left the hearing, I asked them if they supported that plea from the parents to raise the age on AR-15 style rifles to 21. My Republican honor, Byron Donalds. Um, anything that you heard that would get you to support that? No, because the stories are tragic, obviously. I have young kids, they're tragic for me. The truth of the matter is, is that raising the age from 18 to 21, all that does is take away the constitutional rights of 19 and 20 year olds in the United States. Democrats on the committee do support raising the age. And unless something gets done, that mother, Kimberly Rubio, with this message to all of the parents watching. Somewhere out there, there's a mom listening to our testimony, thinking I can't even imagine their pain. 
not knowing that our reality will one day be hers unless we act now. Really gripping testimony there are thanks to Rachel Scott. Joining us now for more on today's emotional hearing is someone who was actually present and in the room, San Jose area Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna. Congressman, thank you so much for your time tonight. You certainly were there and heard brave fourth grader Mia testifying today about how she had to smear the blood on herself to pretend to be dead in an effort to stay alive. You also heard from dads and moms. Let's take a listen to Kimberly Rubio, who lost her daughter Lexi. Somewhere out there, there is a mom listening to our testimony, thinking I can't even imagine their pain, not knowing that our reality will one day be hers, unless we act now. You've seen the numbers. The overwhelming majority of Americans support background checks. They support raising the age to buy assault weapons to 21. What do you say to parents like Kimberly, who have lost all faith that Congress can get anything done? As a father, it was just heartbreaking sitting through that. And when he, she talked about her daughter, Lexi, and the hopes Lexi had of getting a scholarship to go play soccer and becoming a lawyer, uh, it was just devastating. And you had so much testimony from parents who had lost their kids to this senseless violence. We have to get something done. It's why I've said that I'm willing to compromise whatever they can pass in the Senate. I'm going to be for it, even if it moves the ball forward a few yards. You're a father of two young children. How concerned are you when, when you're sending them off to school each day? Well, like any parent, I'm concerned. I mean, it is uh, as it is when you're a parent and you have your kids uh, go off to school. It's, it's tense. It's nervous, especially with young kids. And this just adds uh, trauma. But I'm also concerned about this whole generation that's being raised of fearing school shootings, where in my district they do drills sometimes of hiding under their desk or running. I mean, that's no way as a young person to be raised in America. We, we should not make this a political issue. This should be about the safety and well being of America's children. Hey, Congressman, you suggested today social media companies should bear some responsibility here as the Uvalde shooter posted pictures of his assault rifles on Instagram and messaged about the violence. What can Congress do to force these companies' hands, many of whose headquarters are located right in your district, to, to better regulate their content? Well, we need regulation. What I said uh, this morning in the hearing is that the Uvalde shooter uh, had uh, chats with people talking about uh, school shootings, talking about purchasing weapons. But I think social media companies should have the obligation that if people under 18 are having group chats, that there is some uh, AI or other things monitoring that and flagging it for law enforcement and other agencies. I know you said just a moment ago that you're willing to kind of agree with any action that, that moves the ball forward at all. Is there, would you say, any area of common ground that you see that, that you feel that the, the House will be able to agree on with regard to gun control? Or at this point, are, are you waiting to see what if any bill passes in the Senate? I thought the common ground could be don't have uh, military-style weapons for an 18-year-old and raise it to 21. We're now hearing that even that is too much for some Republicans. So the current conversation is, well, can you have extended background checks for those who are 18 so you at least have a waiting period of two to three weeks before they could get those weapons? Uh, that's obviously not adequate, but it's better than what they can do now. As I've said before, we haven't done in the six years I've been in Congress, we have not done a single thing of substantive uh, for gun violence. And, you know, when I'm done with Congress and my kids or grandkids ask, what did you do? I don't want to have to look at them and say, I was part of a Congress that didn't do anything uh, for the safety of America's children. I'd be curious to see if Americans are, if that is uh, proposed and passed, if Americans are satisfied with that delay of, of simply two to three weeks. But uh, again, that, that all remains to be seen. Before I, I let you go, uh, crime was obviously front and center issue across your state in last night's primaries. It also is for voters across the country. And today in Washington, D.C. area, we saw the disturbing plot to kill Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh revealed. Should the House pass the bill that's already cleared in the Senate to offer increased protection for Supreme Court justices? and their families? Yes. I mean, it's appalling uh, that anyone would con consider uh, committing violence against a Supreme Court Justice or Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. Look, I opposed, uh, vehemently opposed his nomination, and there's a way to do that in this country. It's the democratic process. But to threaten harm 
uh, is uh, outrageous. And I, I am concerned about the safety of all our uh, Supreme Court uh, justices. Uh, justice uh, to be a Jackson has a young family. I mean, we do, they do need protection. Congressman, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming back on the show. Thank you. And we are joined now by Republican Congressman Jody Heiss of Georgia, who participated in today's Oversight Committee hearing as well. Congressman Heiss, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. So first, let me just play a portion of, of what you said in your opening remarks for our viewers. The issue is not gun violence. Guns are not the issue. We have a people violence problems who misuse guns and other means whenever uh, they intend to harm individuals. And then you went on to say that there is a moral and spiritual crisis in this country right now and that we need to respect each other and we need to embrace religious beliefs. Let's take your point on that. Um, but, I, but I do want to ask, in recent years, we've seen 26 people gunned down in a church in Sutherland Springs, Texas, 11 killed in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, and nine worshipers killed at the AME Church in Charleston. So do you pause and, and, and think at all that it may, in fact, be a gun violence problem that threatens Americans who want to peacefully worship? or shop at the grocery store or go to school without the fear of a mass shooting? No, look, there's no question that we have a problem with violence in America, but to blame guns. Look, I, I have and I have had over the years many guns. None of them have ever committed an act of violence because I don't commit acts of violence. The guns are not the issue. The uh, reality that we have violent people is the issue. And the more we continue going down a path with policies to defund the police or to release criminals onto our streets, uh, to be soft on crime, for there to be no consequences uh, for criminal activity and acts of violence, disrespect for the law. These type of things contribute to the problem, not the guns themselves. And so I think we're focusing in uh, a, an unrealistic area as it relates to actually addressing the problem. The problem is a spiritual problem. It's a heart problem of people, and we need to address those issues. And so you yourself just said violent people, that that's the issue. So is it incumbent upon lawmakers then to try to keep or prevent or limit violent people from getting their hands on dangerous weapons by perhaps having red flag laws or doing background checks or raising the age limit? Look, we already have those laws. We already have things, but so many of our laws are ignored. Uh, we don't enforce the laws. Why is it that so many violent people are released to go right back on our streets? Uh, criminals, our goodness, look at our southern border right now. We're allowing who knows uh, who to enter our country. These are issues that we already have laws for, but they're laws that are not being enforced. So for us here in Congress, just to create more laws, uh, it really, is not addressing the problems. Look, there are moral absolutes. And I think we, as a country, need to get back to some of these fundamental principles of reality. Among those is respect for one another, respect for life, respect for the rule of law. These things need to be taught. They need to be a part of our American culture once again. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not. And we are, in many ways, watching the consequences of that. So I just want to pose a question. You were there in the hearing room today when uh, Lexi's mom, Kimberly uh, Rubio, asked lawmakers, why are guns more important to them than children? I, I just want to hear your response to her direct question to the lawmakers today. Well, they're not. Uh, listen, uh, children are important. People are important. Life is important. Uh, that, uh, that question is totally missing the point. What is, what is creating the crimes? What is causing people to commit these uh, mass shootings? It's not the gun that's making people make these decisions. There's something else in our culture that is wrong. We are living at a time where we are pitting one group against another. We are accusing uh, people in one group of, of one thing and, a, and a, a, another. Uh, we are creating an environment of hostility. Uh, we are not teaching respect for law and love for our fellow citizens. Uh, these type of things must become, once again, a part of the American culture. A, a gun by itself is not what is causing someone to just say, hey, let me go out and shoot a bunch of people. There's something inside our culture 
that itself is promoting violence and we certainly need to address some of these things that will address the problem more so than just saying uh, look you can't get a gun unless there's more background checks or a certain age or whatever the the new proposed law may be uh, the gun itself is not the problem you know I do want to talk about potential reforms being debated in Congress. It sounds like you're not really for the reforms and you've suggested that that you don't feel like there should be more laws. You know, a number of people, Republicans in particular, talk about uh, the Second Amendment. And I, I, I re checked it today and it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed but nowhere does it say the right of teenagers the right of 18 year olds that was something that was subsequent right i mean we can look at all the data to suggest and the science to suggest that you know an 18 year old's brain is not fully completed at that point and so why is that especially when you have the parents of of uvaldi and and way beyond and a number of different mass shootings who are urging who are begging who are pleading uh, to just increase the age from, from 18 to 21. Why not? That That is not specific to the Second Amendment. Why not just consider that? Well, it is specific to other constitutional rights, isn't it? I mean, a, an 18-year-old is able to vote. An 18-year-old is, is in our military. Uh, a, uh, an 18-year-old obviously is driving. <clears throat> they uh, virtually, as far as I am uh, am aware of, all constitutional rights apply to individuals that are 18 years of age and over. And so this one would be a unique circumstance that I don't, I don't believe is justified. The majority of mass shootings in this country have been done by people over 21 years of age. And so it's uh, at that point, what do we do with those people? Uh, look, the, at the end of the day, this is a, I believe, a slippery slope that will eventually begin to infringe upon, as you just read, the rights of law-abiding American citizens to keep and bear arms. And that's something that must be protected and defended, and we must address the issue, not the tool, if you will, that provides people the right to defend themselves. I just don't believe that, that raising the age is at, really, at the end of the day, a solution to the violence problem that we have in this country. Okay, last question to you, Congressman. Why do you feel that we are such an anomaly? As was discussed today at the hearing, 288 school shootings in the U.S. compared to five for all of the other G7 countries combined. Look, that's a question that, that many can debate and discuss. But look, here in America, we are a country that's based upon limited government, maximum freedom. For, for individuals, and that in itself is very unique from uh, the vast majority of countries around the world. And there are risks that come with freedom, uh, but within that context, absolutely, we need to do everything we can to address problems, uh, and violence is certainly a problem that needs to be addressed in this country, but it is my firm conviction that at the end of the day, this is showing a heart problem, a spiritual problem, a moral problem, and these problems, by and large, as a country, we are not addressing. We don't teach respect uh, in our schools uh, anymore like we used to. When I was a, a child, for instance, uh, we don't teach the necessity of, of respecting our fellow citizens. We, uh, and all of these things, at the, it, when all is said and done, has uh, negative consequences. And I believe it's, it's time for us to embrace the reality that there is a a God that we will all give an account to one day, that uh, we are all meaningful and purposeful in our lives, and we we need to respect one another. These type of things, I believe, will, uh, in the course of time, have a great effect on the uh, violence that we're watching across this country. All right, Congressman Heisu, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate the academic uh, debate and discussion tonight. Appreciate you sharing your views. Thank you. Now to the threat on the life of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. A man was arrested outside the Chief Justice's home with a pistol, zip ties, and burglary tools in his backpack. Now he's facing attempted murder charges. Here's ABC's Chief Justice correspondent Pierre Thomas with what that man told officers he intended to do. Tonight, an apparently deeply disturbed man is accused of plotting to assassinate Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. You know, the advisor caller came to kill Supreme Court Justice 
Rex Cavanaugh. It was just after 1 a.m. when authorities say Nicholas Roski stepped out of a cab right in front of Justice Kavanaugh's home. Roski of California quickly caught the attention of U.S. Marshals and Montgomery police who were on security detail. The 26-year-old, dressed in black and carrying a backpack and suitcase, walked away from the home. Within minutes, the FBI claims he called 911, telling the dispatcher he was, quote, having suicidal thoughts and that he was there to kill a specific Supreme Court justice. Roski was immediately arrested. Authorities say they discovered a Glock semi-automatic pistol, two magazines of bullets, and burglary gear, including a crowbar, hammer, and padded shoes. Threats of violence and actual violence against the justices, of course, strike at the heart of our democracy. No life is a lie! You don't care if people die! The incident comes amid a series of dramatic protests outside the homes of Supreme Court justices. After the leak of that draft Supreme Court opinion, which suggests the justices are planning to overturn Roe versus Wade. An internal DHS memo released this week warning of an increasingly dangerous threat environment, partially stoked by that pending Supreme Court decision. According to authorities, Roski told them he was there to kill Kavanaugh because he was angry over that draft opinion and the Uvalde shooting. Today, reaction in Washington was swift, with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell calling on House Democrats to approve a Senate bill that would enhance security for the justices. This is exactly, exactly the kind of event that many feared that the terrible breach of the court's rules and norms could fuel. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. When we come back, the 10-year-old accused of fatally shooting a woman who was arguing with her mother. Horror in a popular shopping district of a European capital after a man plows his car into a crowd. But up next, the primetime January 6th hearings are in-depth look at what we know and more on what we might learn once it begins. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. Tomorrow night, the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol will hold its first public hearing in prime time, outlining new evidence and testimonies. We turn once again to our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas, for a look at the investigation until this point. As Congress presents televised hearings and the story of the January 6th attack on the Capitol unfolds, the Justice Department has been increasingly drawn into the political fallout of the House investigation. I have represented myself pro se. On Friday, in a dramatic escalation, the Justice Department reached into the Trump White House, indicting former aide Peter Navarro for contempt of Congress for refusing to cooperate with the House Select Committee. The same charges filed against Trump ally Steve Bannon back in January. Bannon has pleaded not guilty. But DOJ notified House investigators it would not charge former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and his deputy, who both offered some level of cooperation with the committees. Leaders of the committee called the decision puzzling, but the Justice Department appeared to be establishing its independence. DOJ's focus, what prosecutors believed to be clear-cut crimes, with a heavy emphasis on who planned and conducted the worst attack on the Capitol in modern history. The Justice Department's criminal investigation quietly has continued to gather momentum, with the FBI uncovering disturbing allegations. Agents have recently identified two alleged major conspiracies, specific plots to use force to block Joe Biden from becoming president. And authorities say both conspiracies were hatched well in advance of January 6th. Two anti-government groups with far-right leanings, the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, are being portrayed as the primary soldiers in these conspiracies. An ABC News extensive review of charges and recent guilty pleas paint a stark and dark picture. We're going to walk down and I'll be there with you. It was just after 10 a.m. as the Save America rally for President Trump began to build steam that the FBI says 100 members of the Proud Boys gathered at the Washington Monument and decided to make their way to the grounds of the U.S. Capitol. They were soon surrounded by an ever-increasing and boisterous crowd, furious at the prospect that Congress was about to certify Joe Biden as president. By 12.53, the Proud Boys' number had swollen to roughly 300, then a critical moment. Suddenly, the FBI says an apparent member of the Proud Boys becomes the first person to breach Capitol barriers. All hell breaks loose. It looked like a medieval battle scene. It was some of the most brutal combat you know, I've ever, uh, ever encountered. By 2.14 p.m., prosecutors say this alleged Proud Boy, Dominic Pozzola, who has pleaded not guilty to prior charges, used a riot shield he stole from a Capitol Police officer to break a window of the Capitol, clearing the way for the mob. It's shocking. We've never seen anything like this. And what is the most shocking part of it is, if you think about how are they going to stop the certification, there's only one way that you could stop it, and that is to violently interfere with the counting of the votes. New allegations claim that the Proud Boys had formed a so-called Ministry of Self-Defense, and that on January 4th, two days before the attempted insurrection, the group actively discussed a plan to attack the Capitol. The FBI says the group had even developed a written plan that laid out an effort to occupy federal buildings here in Washington. The Oath Keepers, meanwhile, had been amassing an arsenal and had deployed members just outside the city, even stashing arms at local hotels, according to the FBI, which claims they were prepared to use lethal force if necessary. One senior member of the Proud Boys has pleaded guilty to a conspiracy to disrupt the certification of Joe Biden's electors. And three senior leaders of the Oath Keepers have pleaded guilty to a seditious conspiracy to prevent Biden from taking power. All are cooperating with the Justice Department's investigation. And what they did was, one word, they conspired. They conspired together. And what we don't know is, who else did they conspire with? And that's what GOJ needs to continue to seek to find out. And on Monday, the Justice Department raising the stakes indicting the former Proud Boys chairman Enrique Terrio and four others on seditious conspiracy charges as well. They have not yet entered a plea. 
Ontario and the leader of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, have pleaded not guilty to prior conspiracy charges. Both remain in jail pending trial. With federal judges ruling, they are potential dangers to the public. A number of critical questions remain. Among them, who provided the money for the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers and others to travel, stay in hotels and to buy weapons? And who else, if anyone, knew of specific plans by these two groups to block Biden's certification by force. Prosecutors also say the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers were involved with or discussed providing security to a number of VIPs associated with former President Trump that day. Roger Stone and Michael Flynn among them. The Justice Department appears to be trying to see if there was a convergence involving money or coordination between those who organized a political rally and those who organized violence. The investigation expanding clearly far from over. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas for that. And for more analysis ahead of these groundbreaking hearings, we welcome Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor of the Southern District of New York. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so let's big picture this here. And the committee says that there is a mountain of evidence, including that we're going to see some previously before unseen material, including some multimedia presentations. Uh, what is the committee hoping to accomplish by showing these new images? I mean, after all, we've all seen some really shocking footage from January 6th. Right. I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to put it all together for the American public. This is the opportunity for the committee to show what they've done. You know, they've done a huge investigation. They've uh, spoken to a thousand witnesses. They have reviewed a hundred thousand documents. So this is for them, the public facing part of their case to show the public what they've done and show the public the narrative of what they've uh, uncovered. Uh, what do you feel that the most compelling evidence will be? I, I think for the American public, uh, it's going to be what most jurors find compelling. Mm. It's going to be the video. It's going to be the audio. It's going to be the stuff that happened the day of that really brings the public into the tragedy of that day and what the people who uh, were facing the, the riotous acts uh, were feeling at the time. But what can we see beyond what we've already seen? Like, if you've already looked at the video that's been widely out there, how do you feel that additional video will help take you over the edge? Um, and that's a great question. I, I think it's really how the committee tells the story. Mm. Um, so everyone's seen these facts, these images in, in a disparate fashion, and now they're going to tie together those images with testimony from witnesses and, and really try to tell the story as, as would a, a prosecutor bringing a case. And, and how do you think that the prosecutors really thread the needle between making their point and also engaging the media, uh, engaging the public? I, I think one leads to the other, um, meaning that if you engage the public, if you tell a compelling story with evidence, with proof, and you back it up, then that's going to prove their point, and that's going to make their case to the extent that that's what they're trying to do. How unprecedented is this kind of hearing? I, I think it's, hopefully, it's once in a nation's history. Mm. Um, I, I, I can't imagine that it would ever happen again. I hope it would never happen again. So to answer your question, so unprecedented, and I think everyone wishes we're not here at this point. It, it, tomorrow is just a series. It's one in the beginning of a, of a series. What can we expect beyond tomorrow? I think we'll expect more witness testimony, uh, testimony from officers uh, who lived uh, that day. I, I think we'll, we're going to hear from other people who we haven't heard from in the background. Um, and I think we're going to see some text messages and emails that the public hasn't seen. And, and of course, many people did watch the impeachment uh, of proceedings of, of the former president, Donald Trump. How do you feel that, that this will compare to that? I think uh, there'll be a more compelling story to tell here. And, and it's a simple fact of what your evidence is. Mm -hmm. The evidence in the impeachment trial was pretty dry, pretty bland. It, it was hard to translate and for the public to understand what was going on. I think with this case, there's tangible evidence that every American, I think, will understand. Con nowadays, we thank you so much, and we'll have you here with us tomorrow, helping us break it all down as we watch it in real time. Thank you so much.
And ABC News will have full coverage of tomorrow night's primetime hearing starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we'll have a live report breaking it all down at 10 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Still ahead here on Prime, the Russian gains on the battlefield and the heavy losses suffered on both sides, an update on the war in Ukraine. The billion-dollar lawsuit against the FBI from some of the world's top gymnasts. What we can do to protect the ocean and just how important it is for the health of our planet. We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day on this National Best Friend Day, the Hubble Telescope posting this picture of space from its alleged Best Friend satellite. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. Today is World Oceans Day. It's a chance to highlight how important they are to our planet and its future. Let's take a look by the numbers. Oceans cover 71% of the globe and are home to most of the life on our planet. Up to 1 million species live in our oceans, but our oceans are also in grave danger. A recent study found that all marine life could become extinct within 300 years if greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. 410 million people may be at risk by sea level rise caused by climate change. Our oceans have played a major role in helping our planet already. Oceans have absorbed 90% of the excess heat trapped on Earth by greenhouse gas pollution, helping to protect us from the worst impacts of climate change. Without the oceans absorbing all this heat, global average temperatures would have already soared by 100 degrees, making the planet uninhabitable. But it's not too late to change course. The goal of this year's Ocean Day is to protect at least 30% of our lands, waters, and oceans by 2030. Advocates hope the awareness will lead to ending U.S. offshore drilling, which would prevent more than 19 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, something each of us can do to help out do not leave trash behind if you're visiting the beach this summer. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The reality star couple convicted of bank and tax fraud, just how long they could spend behind bars. And on this Pride Month, we take a look at the history of ball culture. But first, look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. At stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust 
and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Shark Fest is back. What? With four weeks, 27 new premieres, yeah! and more platforms than ever before. Let's go! Shark, 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 shark. shark Fest starts Sunday, July 10th. On next video and Disney Plus. Today, in a congressional hearing on gun violence, words of despair from those whose lives were forever changed by the deadly mass shootings in Uvalde and Buffalo. Today, I come because I could have lost my baby girl. Miguel Cirillo, the father of Mia Cirillo, the 11-year-old fourth grader who survived the attack at Robb Elementary that killed 19 of her schoolmates and two beloved teachers. Mia only survived by covering herself in her classmates' blood and playing dead. Today, House Democrats bringing the Protect Our Kids Act to the floor for a vote. The gun control package, assembled after the recent mass shootings, includes several actions President Biden favors, but is expected to fail in the Senate. German officials are trying to determine if a man who drove into a crowd did so intentionally. According to Berlin police, the incident happened on Rockenstrasse at around 10.30 a.m. local time. At least one person is dead and eight seriously injured. It's unclear how many are mildly injured. The driver is in custody, though it's unclear what his motives were and whether he purposefully drove into the crowd. Fighting raging all over the Donbass region. President Zelensky saying that a stalemate with Russia is not an option. Ukraine is still taking the fight to their invaders, but Russia is claiming a victory in Ukraine. The defense ministry says it's been able to connect the country through the Donbass region down to Crimea, which it annexed in 2014. This is the land bridge, which Moscow said was one of its main goals. The Kremlin claims to have taken over large swathes of the Donbass, even saying it has control of 97% of the Luhansk region. The sheer force of Russian firepower clear in these new satellite images, entire areas flattened. Some of the world's top gymnasts have accused the FBI of turning a blind eye to reports of sexual abuse. And now they want the agency to pay for it. Simone Biles, Ali Raisman, and Michaela Maroney, among the 90 young women who are filing a tort claim directly with the FBI, demanding a billion dollars for its mishandling of credible complaints of sexual assaults by former USA Gymnastics team doctor Larry Nasser. Orlando police have arrested a 10-year-old girl accused of shooting and killing a woman arguing with her mother on Memorial Day. Just before midnight last Tuesday, investigators say Lucretia Isaac started a fight with 41-year-old LaShawn Rogers over a social media post. Police say Isaac, the child's mother, handed her 10-year-old daughter a bag with the gun inside. 
They say the child then took the gun out and shot and killed Rogers. A judge ordered that the 10-year-old remain in custody at the Orange County Juvenile Justice Center on charges of second-degree murder. Hard reality is setting in for Todd and Julie Chrisley. The stars of the reality series Chrisley Knows Best found guilty of bank fraud and tax evasion. Federal prosecutors saying the couple swindled at least $30 million from community banks between 2007 and 2012, a jury finding them guilty on all charges. Their hit reality show Chrisley Knows Best premiered in 2014 and follows the life and times of real estate tycoon Todd Chrisley and his family. Prosecutors say the couple hid millions of dollars made from the reality show, submitted fake loans and bank statements, and evaded hundreds of thousands in taxes dating all the way back to 2009. The Chrisleys could face up to 30 years in prison. Welcome back now to the pandemic and to promising news tonight on what could be the next booster. Tonight, Moderna says their updated vaccine booster offers up to eight times more protection against the Omicron variant. It could be ready in time for any new waves that might take place in the fall. Drag and ballroom, it's not just fashion or runway looks, it's a philosophy, a phenomenon, and most of all, a family. Here's a sneak peek of our remarkable Soul of a Nation Hour, Pride to be Seen. Drag is self-expression, it's everything. Honestly, let's be real, drag is freedom. Drag encompasses everything that I love, whether it's hair, makeup, dance. The wig is literally like that moment where I really feel like I'm transformed into like the drag persona. If I wanna wear a suit with sequins, I can do that too and feel fierce and flawless. I'm a drag queen, I'm the queen, but I'm also like the Marie Antoinette queen because I ate a lot of cake. I don't really know, girl. I just showed up today. Drag is one of the most vital art forms in pop culture today. Oh, work, I love that. As RuPaul most famously says, you're born naked and the rest is drag. You better work, never girl. RuPaul has been a staple in mainstream America for decades now. I'm in college and there's Ru doing supermodel. It felt so empowering. Do your thing on the runway. In 1993, when she performed Supermodel at the, the Gay March in Washington, it became an anthem. I think what Rue has done has been to shift people's perception of an entire community of people. Peace, love, and hair grease, I love you! Today, drag queens have become extremely mainstream, ushering in their own makeup lines, doing commercials for luxury cars, posing in windows of Saks Fifth Avenue, and winning Emmy Awards. RuPaul's Drag Race. Every country, every culture has its own drag tradition. The Drag Race España. It's become this sort of global family. Drag Race Thailand. Class. Dare I say it? We're here. What you may be familiar with in terms of popular movies or television shows are men dressed in drag, whether it's Tootsie, whether it's Flip Wilson's Geraldine. What we're talking about is actually drag culture, which is a lot more nuanced. We owe such an homage to the queens that came before us, the herstory, true herstory of drag. There were laws against putting on a dress, dressing as a member of the, the opposite sex. We understood what it was like when we were ostracized. It was like hush, hush. You basically were looking up gay bars, hoping it doesn't get raided. The 1960s were really important for the queer community when it came to LGBTQ plus equality. And so by the time Stonewall rolled around, it was basically just lighting a stick of dynamite. And drag queens were completely instrumental in all of that. These are our finalists. There's this movie called The Queen that people need to see. It's a documentary film, late 60s. And it is about a drag pageant. You get a glimpse of what it must have been like when everybody was in the closet. Well, you know my mother, uh, she doesn't really accept it. She just sort of said that she wouldn't talk about it anymore. She really doesn't understand. Crystal LaBeja walks and comes in third place and critiques by walking off stage. Crystal, where are you going? Because of skin color, she felt that she was not treated fairly. It's in bad taste and you're showing your color and you should have... I am, I am doing a bad, but I got an... I have a right to show my color, darling. No I am beautiful and I know I'm beautiful. The very first house was created as a result in many ways of that moment. The house of La Beige is created named after Christmas. 
And you begin to see the morphing from drag ball to house ball. House ball is an event created by queer and trans kids of color. And these balls, you know, basically were unknown to the masses until the documentary Paris is Burning. There was family. I saw us. I saw possibility. Virginia Slim's girl is here. I didn't know that we could look that great or be that great. Voguing was an expression of a culture that was born out of, like, oppression and pain and joy and love. <laughs> It is so beautiful to go to a ball and to see the family aspects that, as POC queer people, they may not receive by their biological family. As a black trans woman, when I walk into ballroom, I see love. I see a place where I can feel like I belong. There are competition in which people are competing against one another in various categories. There's all sorts of amazing events, like the latex ball or the OTA functions. That world has basically been the heart of like television shows such as Legendary. Our arms control category. And Pose. The category is Bring It Like Royalty. Let's be real, come on. What category do you think I walk? I walk face. There's a Vogue category. There's the hand. There's a duck walk. There's the hair spinning. There's the dip. Outside the ballroom, people call it the death drop dip. Let's get sick, me. Yeah. The dip, hair whips, the shade, all of that originated from ballroom culture and is popularized on RuPaul's Drag Race, including that sense of community. We are a family here. Now we're living in a time where I can be a trans man doing feminine drag on national television and being able to get the platform to tell my story. This show has helped humanize a lot of people. It gives me hope that the next generation of kids might not have it as hard as we did back then. Have fun. Every single drag queen isn't on television. You have drag queens in your local bars right now, and they are all part of the same story. Drag is a testament to us being here. So, baby, try as you might. We gonna be here, we gonna fight. Oh, did I just rhyme? <laughs> I did. And then they do a death drop, and it's fantastic. It's not a death drop. It's a dip. That is some dip. And be sure to check out the entire hour celebrating the LGBTQ plus community. Soul of a Nation presents Pride to be seen. It will air tomorrow at 10 Eastern, 8 Pacific on ABC. But you can, of course, catch it later on Hulu. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. This man just dove in to plant coral and restore damage to a reef near his home in Bali, Indonesia. On this World Oceans Day, let us all try to protect our home. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Next hour, will those heart-wrenching gun hearings actually move the needle when it comes to those high-stakes negotiations for some type of gun control? And the three-year-old lost in the woods of Montana for days and the happy ending. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into the black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact
fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7", is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is, that is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Gas prices are so high, one Michigan county has run out of funds for gas. Isabella County says it will now need to respond to non-emergency calls over the phone. The town has sent has several months till its next budget starts. The average price of gas jumped up again today by five cents to four dollars ninety-six cents per gallon. A family of a three-year-old is so happy to be back with their son after he spent two days lost in the woods. Authorities say Riker Webb disappeared while playing with his dog outside his Montana home. Dozens helped in the search to find him, and when they did, they say that he was hungry and cold but healthy. And President Biden is in Los Angeles for the Summit of the Americas, but the event has been marred with controversy. Mexico refused to attend because the U.S. did not invite Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. The president is expected to announce a new partnership focusing on the economic recovery from the depths of the pandemic. Now to the emotional testimony on Capitol Hill. Uvalde victims and their loved ones told their stories one by one, all asking lawmakers for change. One fourth grader described how she had to smear blood from her friend on herself and play dead in order to survive. Tonight, the House is debating gun reform in the wake of so much grief and tragedy. Here's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. I am Kimberly Rubio. This is Felix Rubio. Tonight, in front of the nation, the gut-wrenching testimony from the families who have lived this. Kimberly and Felix Rubio lost their 10-year-old daughter, Lexi, and Uvalde. Both parents were at the school that very morning for award ceremonies. Lexi received the Good Citizen Award and was also recognized for receiving all A's. At the conclusion of the ceremony, we took photos with her before asking her to pose for a picture with her teacher, Mr. Reyes. That photo, her last photo ever, was taken at approximately 10.54 a.m. To celebrate, we promised to get her ice cream that evening. Then the mass shooting. Like so many parents, they frantically showed up, waiting for hours, then taken to the Civic Center. Soon after, we received the news that our daughter was among the 19 students and two teachers that died as a result of gun violence. We don't want you to think of Lexi as just a number. She was intelligent, compassionate, and athletic. She was quiet, shy, unless she had a point to make. So today, we stand for Lexi. And as her voice, we demand action. We seek a ban on assault rifles and high capacity magazines. We understand that for some reason, to some people, to people with money, to people who fund political campaigns, that guns are more important than children. So at this moment, we ask for progress. We seek to raise the age to purchase these weapons from 18 to 21 years of age. We seek red flag laws, stronger background checks. We also want to repeal gun manufacturers' liability immunity. Also in front of the country today, a brave 11-year-old, Mia Cerillo, survived. On video, telling lawmakers about the moment the gunman told her teacher goodnight and then shot her in the head. Mia saying she played dead by putting the blood from her friend on her clothes. He shot my friend that was next to me. And I thought he was going to come back to the room. So I grabbed the blood and, and put it all over me. And what did you do then when you put the blood on yourself? Just stay quiet. And then I got my teacher's phone and called 911. 
And what did you tell 911? I told her that we need help and to send the police in, the, in our classroom. There was also Dr. Roy Guerrero, the only pediatrician in Uvalde, who cared for many of the children since birth. Two children whose bodies had been pulverized by bullets fired at them, decapitated, whose flesh had been ripped apart, that the only clue at their identities was a blood splattered cartoon clothes still clinging to them. A gun owner himself, the doctor calling for change. Innocent children all over the country today are dead because laws and policy allows people to buy weapons before they're legally old enough to even buy a pack of beer. They're dead because restrictions have been allowed to lapse. They're dead because there are no rules about where guns are kept because no one is paying attention to who is buying them. Another witness called by Republicans argued it's not the guns. Lucretia Hughes lost her 19-year-old son to gun violence, countering what others said. I claim that nothing in these bills do anything to make us safer or address the mental health crisis in this country. I believe it is our God-given right to defend ourselves from any act of violence. The chairwoman of the House Oversight Committee comparing the U.S. to other countries, arguing it is a gun problem. As you can see in this chart, in 2019, the United States suffered 17 times more gun deaths than the next highest G7 country. Between 2009 and 2018, the U.S. had 288, 288 school shootings. All other G7 countries combined had just five. Some of my colleagues on, across the aisle have blamed the violence on mental illness. They have blamed violent video games. They have blamed family values. They have even blamed open doors. They have blamed everything but guns. But we know the United States does not have a monopoly on mental illness, video games, or any other excuse. What America does have is widespread access to guns. The ranking Republican on the committee and his response. Too often tragedies are politicized for partisan gain. And we have seen many seek to leverage these crimes and their victims to push for radical left-wing policies or to betray their campaigns. And as lawmakers left the hearing, I asked them if they supported that plea from the parents to raise the age on AR-15 style rifles to 21. My Republican weapon. Byron Donald. Um, anything that you heard that would get you to support that? No, because the stories are tragic, obviously. I have young kids, they're tragic for me. The truth of the matter is, is that raising the age from 18 to 21, all that does is take away the constitutional rights of 19 and 20 year olds in the United States. Democrats on the committee do support raising the age. And unless something gets done, that mother, Kimberly Rubio, with this message to all of the parents watching. Somewhere out there, there's a mom listening to our testimony, thinking I can't even imagine their pain not knowing that our reality will one day be hers unless we act now. Such gripping testimony there. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, as you reported, Democrats do support raising the age on AR-15 style rifles. Republicans do not. You were told the testimony did not change their minds. Is the bill coming out of that committee going anywhere? And in the Senate, what's the status of that small bipartisan effort to get something done? Well, Lindsay, the House is on track to pass sweeping gun control legislation tonight, and that does include raising the legal age limit to purchase a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21. But the vast majority of Republicans in the Senate are not on board with that, so they are continuing their discussions with Democrats on a measure that would be more limited. That includes strengthening background checks, funding to enact red flag laws for mental health, for school security. But as of now, Lindsay, I'm told that raising the age limit and an assault weapons ban, that is currently off the table in these discussions, Lindsay. Seems like it's a non-starter. Our Rachel Scott reporting in from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel.
Now to the threat on the life of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. A man was arrested outside the Chief Justice's home with a pistol, zip ties, and burglary tools in his backpack. Now he's facing attempted murder charges. Here's ABC's Chief Justice correspondent Pierre Thomas with what that man told officers he intended to do. Tonight, an apparently deeply disturbed man is accused of plotting to assassinate Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Unit Speed Advisor caller came to kill Supreme Court Justice Rex Kavanaugh. It was just after 1 a.m. when authorities say Nicholas Roski stepped out of a cab right in front of Justice Kavanaugh's home. Roski of California quickly caught the attention of U.S. Marshals and Montgomery police who were on security detail. The 26-year-old, dressed in black and carrying a backpack and suitcase, walked away from the home. Within minutes, the FBI claims he called 911, telling the dispatcher he was, quote, having suicidal thoughts and that he was there to kill a specific Supreme Court justice. Roski was immediately arrested. Authorities say they discovered a Glock semi-automatic pistol, two magazines of bullets, and burglary gear, including a crowbar, hammer, and padded shoes. Threats of violence and actual violence against the justices, of course, strike at the heart of our democracy. No life is alive! You don't care if people die! The incident comes amid a series of dramatic protests outside the homes of Supreme Court justices. After the leak of that draft Supreme Court opinion, which suggests the justices are planning to overturn Roe versus Wade. An internal DHS memo released this week warning of an increasingly dangerous threat environment, partially stoked by that pending Supreme Court decision. According to authorities, Roski told them he was there to kill Kavanaugh because he was angry over that draft opinion and the Uvalde shooting. Today, reaction in Washington was swift, with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell calling on House Democrats to approve a Senate bill that would enhance security for the justices. This is exactly, exactly the kind of event that many feared that the terrible breach of the court's rules and norms could fuel. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, has there been an increase in threats against the justice system? <laughs> there has, Lindsay. Threats investigated against federal judges, prosecutors, and courthouses nearly quadrupled in the last four years. Roski, if convicted, faces up to 20 years in prison. Lizzie. All right, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Now to reports of a deadly military crash in California, an Osprey going down. Officials with the Marines confirmed there were five people on board the Osprey when it crashed in rural Southern California, not far from the Mexican border. Last March, an Osprey crashed in Norway during NATO exercises, killing four Marines. Per military protocol, it will be at least 24 hours before we know the identity of those on board. We shift now to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic. Moderna announced the results of its updated vaccine that they claim could could be a major game changer in the fight against the virus. The pharmaceutical company says the next generation vaccine is much more effective against the Omicron variant than its original vaccine. This as a growing number of Americans appear to be getting reinfected as new variants emerge. ABC's Trevor Alt has the details. Tonight, promising news for the next booster shot that could be perfectly timed for the fall. Moderna calling its updated shot a clearly superior booster, offering seven to eight times more neutralizing antibodies against Omicron than the original vaccine a month after injection, saying it's just as safe as prior shots and likely last longer. We have high levels now that will probably even increase and mature over time, potentially giving people protection over a full year. Moderna's hoping this could pave the way for an annual COVID shot like we do for the flu. The company's already producing large quantities, expecting authorization and a fall rollout. But the virus is mutating quickly, and preliminary data shows the new vaccine may be slightly less protective against the latest Omicron subvariants BA4 and 5. We just don't quite know what next variant is around the corner. We have now the BA4 and 5 variants that are increasing. We expect that this booster will provide some protection against future Omicron subvariants, but we still don't know. There are still 4,000 Americans with COVID going into hospitals every day, and deaths are expected to climb in the coming weeks. Experts stress if you're due for a booster, you shouldn't wait for the new vaccine. The better you know, strategy is to make sure to top up your immunity, get that protection now, and then, of course, get that future booster when you become eligible.
Trevor All joins us now. Trevor, Moderna is planning to submit its data as quickly as possible for a potential rollout in the fall. The company believes this could pave the way for an annual COVID shot. That's right, Lindsay. So it's just like a flu shot for the flu season. Moderna executives say they particularly want to provide protection for the respiratory virus season, which here in America and all of North America is October into April. And this new vaccine could be authorized just in time to do that. Lindsay. All right. Just in time for that potential uptick. Many are concerned about Trevor Alt. Our thanks to you. Former President Trump, Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka Trump have all agreed to answer questions under oath in the New York Attorney General's civil investigation into their business practices. This is supposed to happen in mid-July and at issue is how the family valued its real estate holdings. The Trumps had tried to stop this from happening, arguing the investigation was politically motivated, but a state court rejected that. The Trumps have until Monday to file another appeal to that same New York State Supreme Court. We turn next to the January 6th committee and the high stakes primetime hearing set for tomorrow night. Let's bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. John, this investigation has been going on for nearly a year at this point. So what can Americans expect to see tomorrow that's different from what we've already learned? Well, you have the live witnesses. There's a Capitol Hill police officer. Her name is Caroline Edwards, who was badly injured in the in the uh, in the attack. You'll hear her eyewitness account of what happened, and in the aftermath, you'll also hear from a documentary filmmaker that most Americans uh, probably have never heard of. His name is Nick Quested, and he was embedded with the Proud Boys as they attacked the Capitol. Uh, he's got quite a dramatic story. He was there throughout it all. He and a small film crew documented it all, and he has turned over hours of videotape a uh, shot by him and his crew members uh, of the attack some of it inside the building I have seen uh, a, a section of this uh, a, a bit of this video it is very dramatic and different from what we have seen so far and you can expect that to be a big part of the hearing uh, tomorrow as well but remember there's been there have been hundreds of interviews that have been done uh, closed doors but taped uh, there have been you know in, in documents gotten from the National Archives. There's a lot of information that they have been sifting through, and now's their chance uh, to present it to the American public, a lot of it that we have not seen. And John, you said that you got a chance to see it. It's, is it more dramatic than what we've already seen? Well, here's what's different about it. In some ways, yes. Some of it is quite uh, grisly. I, I don't know how they're going to deal with, with, with showing it. I mean, you do see uh, the aftermath of two of the, uh, you see one person who, uh, you know, as basically they're dying, you see the aftermath of Ashley Babbitt's mm. uh, uh, getting, getting shot. Uh, but what's different about this, uh, uh, Lindsay, is this is professionally shot video. So much of what we've seen was captured uh, by people on their cell phones and the like in the melee. This is, this is, this is different footage. It's hard to really explain the impact when you watch it. It's just the fact that it is so clear so direct and so in the middle of it all. I mean, Nick Quested and his three other uh, crew members were right there with these people as they attacked the Capitol. What more do we know about Trump's inner circle and, and what the committee intends to present? Well, you remember Ivanka Trump, Jared Kushner, Donald Trump Jr., uh, several of his top aides have gone into the committee and talked under oath behind closed doors, but in interviews that were videotaped. So you can expect to see uh, some of those interviews, even if those people are not live witnesses, you will see those interviews. And, you know, let's just take one example. Uh, Ivanka Trump, I'm told, is 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 quite candid about the fact that she uh, that, 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 that she told her father uh, that he needed to do something to, to get out there to stop the riot. Uh, that, that uh, you know, Jared Kushner uh, didn't agree with much of what uh, the Trump legal team was trying to do in terms of turning over the election. So this, I think, will be uh, some eye-opening testimony, again, not live testimony in, in the case of the family members, but testimony that was done under oath and now will be seen uh, as these committees go for as these hearings go forward. All right, just fascinating. We'll look forward to seeing what uh, they've laid out for tomorrow. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Thank you, Lindsay. And still to come, the thousands on the move from the southern Mexico border heading for the U.S. We have the latest. And the groundbreaking Hulu show about how an Australian trans teen navigates her life. We speak with her. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. More than 80 people are feared to have died in Sunday's attack at a church in Nigeria. Sources told ABC News police officials said that they are still investigating and working to determine what the final casualty, casualty count is. Authorities have recovered from the scene three unexploded IEDs along with fragments of detonated IEDs and pellets. The assailants have yet to be identified. 5,000 members of that migrant caravan on its way to our southern border managed to receive humanitarian and temporary temporary visas in Mexico, which allow free passage throughout the country. The migrant caravan made up of Venezuelan, Cuban, and Central American citizens walk for several hours in the midst of intense heat and rain. President Joe Biden is expected to announce a regional pact on migration later in the week. Plugging your cell phone could soon be less of a hassle for millions of Europeans after EU countries and lawmakers agreed to a single mobile charging port for mobile phones, tablets, and cameras in a world's first. The change, which will only allow USB-C connectors, is set to have a major impact on Apple, which will have to change the connector on iPhones sold in Europe by 2024. The political intervention, which the European Commission said would make life easier for consumers and save them money, came after companies failed to reach a common solution. The first day of high school is often tough for most of us, but if you're transgender, there are unique challenges and anxieties that come with every new chapter. That's the subject of the critically acclaimed show, First Day. As a transgender girl, Hannah Branford, played by Evie McDonald, not only has to navigate the challenges that come with starting a new school, but find the courage to live as her most authentic self. Take a look. This is the first year I get to go back to school feeling good about it. I'm gonna rob the class captain. I bet they've never had a trans class captain before. What's that got to do with it? Joining us now is writer, director, and producer Julie Kalsif and star of the series Evie McDonald. Julie and Evie, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. So, Julie, many people have, have never met a trans child or, or have only perhaps seen one on, on TV or online. Uh, tell us about creating First Day and, and your motivation behind it. Um, I think some people think that they probably haven't met a trans child or trans person, but it doesn't mean that they haven't. Um, sure. I think what we wanted to do with First Day was to um, bring a character like Hannah into their screens. The inspiration for the series was based on um, a family member that's very close to me and I wanted her to see that she wasn't alone and I wanted her to see herself represented on screen. And we're hoping that other trans kids see that as well and that other children learn how to be good allies from watching this show. 
And Evie, you and your character, Hannah, have many similarities, starting with the fact that you're both transgender. What's it like to play Hannah and go through her experiences, some of which I imagine are very similar to your own? Um, it's very gratifying because it was the first time that I've ever seen or gotten to play a transgender role. And I felt like this is exactly what television needed. So to play somebody who I've always wanted to see growing up, that was, that was really important to me. And Julie, first day is a testament really to the power of a family's unconditional love for a transgender child. Hannah's family tackles anti-trans obstacles head on so that Hannah can live her most authentic life. Why was it important for you to do this kind of show, uh, showing this supportive family unit? It's, it's critical. I think um, the statistics are quite clear with transgender children. If they don't have family support, their, um, their, their rate of, of suicide goes up and their rates of self-harm escalate as well. Trans, any children are vulnerable. All children need family support. And for trans kids, it's especially important because they need that family support to help them through what for some of them is a very difficult time. If they don't have that support, then who, who do they go to? And Evie, first day shows some similarities that trans children have with their classmates, but, but also some that they don't share, like hormonal changes or even hanging out with friends at a sleepover. What did showing these scenes mean for you? Um, I think it's opening people's eyes to some of the challenges that transgender people might face. I think a lot of people can judge a person by their cover and I like the way that first day goes into depth and you really get to see that Hannah is just a person and she still has chores and rules and it shows more of a humanity to the character. And, and this question is, is for both of you. First Day has touched so many adults and children in Australia now beyond your native country. What message do you hope that viewers will take away from this show? I honestly hope that after people watch this, they have a better understanding of trans people. I know that there's a lot of ignorance and um, uneducation out there, and I feel like this has helped a lot of people even understanding what it means to be trans and that we're just normal people. Julie, your hopes for yeah. viewers? Yeah, I agree with Evie. I think um, what what we want people to take away from this show is to realise that Hannah is just a normal child at middle school and she's just trying to get on with her life. We've had a, um, a federal election here recently and trans kids became a, a political issue for just for, for reasons beyond my understanding. But it's it seems that every time politicians want to um, score points that they target trans kids and all trans kids want to do is just to live their lives and to be treated like everyone else and we're hoping that the, that the show helps with that. Julie and Evie, we thank you so much for your time and joining us tonight. First Day is now streaming on Hulu. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come, decades-long pen pals finally meet. We have their story when we come back. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. It is a get-together between friends that was three decades in the making. A woman from Northeast Ohio and a woman from Brazil are finally getting to meet, even though they've known each other since the fifth grade. Catherine Ross from our partner station, WEWS, shows us how the pair first connected and how they finally came together face-to-face -to -face in tonight's local lowdown. In a nearly empty airport, after several delayed flights, Tanya Niemer is holding on to souvenirs from a long friendship. This is the guide of her city, so she wanted me to look and see what her city is like, and she put little notes in them. The guides and letters have been connecting Tanya with Georgette Vitorino over 5,000 miles. And we've been writing each other since fifth grade, so it's been about, I'm going to age myself, 33 years. The pen pals met each other when Tanya was at Copley Fairline. Miss McGarvey from Copley, um, she, she's the one who said, you know, we need to broaden our horizons and let's connect with a school in Brazil and I'm going to pair you up and connect you. Saturday, um, the two are connected in person. It was amazing <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, to finally arrive. And but, the connection is clear. Uh, there were so many parallels in our lives. So. Both women, who always shared a love of writing and birthdays just days apart, grew up to become attorneys, raised families, and never lose touch. What I, what I think is so special is that you can have so many wonderful feelings for a person you have never seen before. Yeah. A whirlwind trip for Georgette and her husband includes a scavenger Avenger hunt around Hudson Saturday. I wonder yeah, if that's here. the friends exploring Northeast Ohio and finding friendship can spark through letters, span continents, and last years. That, you know, good people are everywhere, and um, she's really one of them. Finally coming together. Our thanks to Catherine for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news.